everybody. Welcome to Cornerstone Online. We are thinking about you and praying for you uh, in these extraordinary times. I wanted to give some announcements today and some information as we uh, move forward with our online worship times. Giving um, finances remain an important thing uh, for the operation of a church. And so wanted to let you know that we had a strong march uh, because of your ongoing giving uh, financially. And so grateful for that. Thank you for that. Uh, we'd encourage you to keep that up. We are able to keep our spending uh, slim, of course, in this new format. And then our giving has remained solid. Um, you can give online at our website, csgreeley.org. There's a giving uh, column on the top. And if you click on that, you can build an account. You can give a one-time gift. Uh, you can set up recurring giving. We'd encourage you to do that if you haven't done that already. Um, you can also text to give. And the way you do that is you just text C.S. Greeley to 77977 and then follow the prompts after it sends you a link. I just learned today, which is a great thing, you can also text C.S. Greeley app. Uh, to 77977, and that's going to send you a link that will uh, allow you to download our app, and you can give uh, through the app as well. So watch for additional information on finances, and of course, if you have any questions or run into any problems, contact myself or Lois Morris in the church office, and you can find our contact information on the website as well. One thing we've been doing now for a couple weeks is a update on our prayer information. You will see if you go to the website under connect, uh, there will be a PDF as well as a printable version of the prayer information. Uh, we wanted to let you know that this uh, link is going out uh, in the all church email. And when you get that email, um, you're gonna be able to go right to that page and look at either the PDF or the printable version of the prayer information. We are not sending out regular emails uh, as has been our history with Prayer Chain, but rather um, they'll be housed on this part of our website. So anytime you want to throughout the week, go on there and as we get requests, information and updates, we will uh, record those and those will be uh, dated uh, so you can see which one you're looking at. So that's how that's working. Next week, we will begin our new series, Traits of the Greats. We will be looking at various individuals of the Bible and what characteristics and traits they had that helped shape their faith and form their identity. And so the preaching team will be taking this series and asking the question, what did the faith of these individuals look like? And how did it motivate their actions and decisions? And how did it shape their life? So uh, next week, May 3rd, the first one will be Hezekiah. I'll be taking that one as we kick that series off. So uh, tune in for that. We look forward to walking through that in the coming months. Today, Don is preaching a message entitled, Wake Up My Soul. And he would like for us to be prepared as we watch the sermon today uh, with a Bible, either a paper version or the app, and then a way to take notes. So uh, have paper and pen ready or a uh, app that you can use to take notes and then be prepared to interact uh, with the text and with the sermon that way. Um, we love you guys. We miss you. Um, it's strange to uh, not be able to gather physically together, but we are um, excited to be able to continue to do this online format, and uh, let's worship and hear what God has to say to us through the text today. See you soon.
Lord, we lift you up this day as the lamb on the throne. We lift you up as the one who holds all things in your hands, who holds all things together, who gave your all, your, your life for each one of us. We, and then you took your rightful place on the throne next to your Father in heaven, and we praise you now. We uh, thank you that the Holy Spirit is there interceding for each one of us, and we have many things to ask this morning. We pray for those who serve, especially in difficult places. We pray for those who um, continue to work on the front lines of this virus, and we just pray protection over them. We pray especially for those who've lost loved ones during this time, those who are still struggling with illnesses. We pray especially for your healing over them. We pray for those who've lost income and have anxiety and fears because of that. We turn to you now. We give you all of our concerns. We trust in your answers. We trust in your faithfulness. We pray that you would take away any fears and anxiety. We give it all to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, Cornerstone. Uh, it's great to be with you again this morning. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share with you this uh, story that um, just recently happened to me. So in order to get ready to do that, what I'd like to do is I'd like uh, you to take that uh, piece of paper I asked you to get and pen, and if you would take the time now uh, to uh, get that out and write down uh, uh, some answers to this question. Uh, before I do, though, if you need, um, I'm guessing, a minute or something like that, why don't uh, you take a look at this, um, this, or hear the question and take a look at this slide. You'll see the question again. And just push pause and take your, all the time you need to write out your answer. And um, then when you're ready, just uh, jump back in. So here's the question to help kind of get you on board with what I'd like to share uh, this morning. What have you personally lost uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic? So what have you lost? If you can just jot the things down that you've lost uh, during this time, and then we'll be right back and begin. So I want to thank you for um, writing those ideas down. And even though we really don't have any way to engage, uh, you know, in, um, with those ideas um, here this morning, I think it gets us all kind of at least started uh, down the road to what I want to share this morning. I had to give a name to our uh, time together. So I'm calling it Wake Up My Soul and or Wake Up My Soul and Trust in Him, which is really the... Um, it's words taken from this song by Christine DeMarco called It Is Well, which I'm going to reference a little bit later. Um, I want to tell you what happened to me on Easter, this, this Easter, just two weeks ago. And I want to tell you what happened to me. And I want to tell you, not for the purpose of sympathy, but I want to tell you for the purpose of encouragement for your heart. But before I tell you what happened, let's talk about this loss um, that we've all experienced one way or another. Some of us have experienced minimal loss. Um, this COVID-19 thing really hasn't uh, changed our lives all that much, really hasn't impacted us a whole lot. We maybe uh, wear a mask now when we go to the grocery store or uh, who knows what. And for others on the opposite end of the um, spectrum, it's impacted our lives significantly, so much so that um, we're willing to say, hey, uh, things might never go back to normal again. So let's talk about this loss, though, and let's mention some of these things. If you're a student, uh, obviously you lost your school year. You're not going to school anymore. Well, you're doing Google Classroom or something like that, but you're not going to see your friends at school anymore. If you are part of a sports team, um, that's just been blowing all the smithereens, and you're not playing sports right now and probably not this summer. Some of you are begging God to allow you to play football next fall. You don't even know if that will happen. Some of you involved in music or in drama or theater or something like that, you've probably lost performance opportunities. And if you are a graduate or were going to graduate, 
You'll still graduate, by the way. You just won't have a ceremony to celebrate it. Probably not a big party to celebrate it either. If you're a church member, like all of you probably are, obviously we've lost the opportunity to worship together, of even just being together and seeing each other and, and hanging out together. Um, I had this weird experience about a week and a half ago where I attended a funeral uh, for someone who passed away with COVID-19. Uh, not really a funeral, though. It was just the internment. And what it meant was, is we all drove in our own cars to Lynn Grove Cemetery. We all sat in our cars, and from the road, we watched a pastor and a few family members stand by the grave, read the liturgy, pray, and then return to their cars. And we all drove off. Now, I'm, I was glad to be there, but what a loss to not be able to talk to those people and to bring some kind of comfort and share with them. A family, if you're part of a family, you've lost vacations maybe, or you've canceled trips, or you've postponed them. Uh, maybe you've postponed your wedding. What's going to happen with that or your family reunion? Some of you with your job, your job has changed drastically. Uh, maybe you, like me, I've been sequestered like to an upstairs bedroom, that's now my office, um, and living through kind of what feels like a never-ending Groundhog Day kind of experience. Um, maybe you lost your job, or maybe you got furloughed. That's even more life-changing. You know, we've all experienced a lot of loss in our social lives and in our, even in our sense of thinking about the future. Audrey Frank, one of the blog writers that I read, says uh, that this loss is a loss of the privilege of planning. <clears throat> I've never really even thought about the privilege of planning, but I'm starting to realize what a valuable gift that is, is to be able to plan the future. Now, in the loss, we've gotten all sorts of uh, gain, mostly uh, questions, like a thousand questions, right? Like uh, one of the main questions I often think about is, like, when is this going to be over? Uh, when can we go back to normal? Um, when can we leave our homes? Uh, when can we go to church again? Uh, when can I start planning my wedding? When can I um, get the, or can I get this virus more than once? Uh, will there be a second wave of infections? Um, when will we have a vaccine? And it seems like to all of these kinds of questions, there's one answer. And the answer is, we just don't know. Um, you know, I like this. Uh, you'll see this slide in a moment. I like this guy, this guy on the slide a lot. But I wish he wouldn't say this, we just don't know, so, so often. Now, um, I want to I wanna take all of that stuff, all of that stuff about loss, and I want to ask you just to kind of put that up on the, the mental shelf for a moment. And now I want to turn our attention to uh, the scripture. I want you to think about with me this morning the, uh, the Apostle John. You know, in the Gospel of John, the guy who calls himself the beloved disciple, I want you to think about that guy. But I want you to think about John, the Apostle John, when the book of Revelation takes place. At that time, most scholars believe John is a very old man. He's been banished to the island of Patmos, which is functionally a penal colony. He's been isolated from the people that he normally hangs out with. He's been stripped of movement throughout Asia Minor. John probably knows people in all of the seven churches of Asia Minor. And his future has basically just been put on hold by going to this island. And I'm going to suggest one of the things that we often forget about the Apostle John is, is that he is overwhelmed by his losses. You know, some of, I, I don't know how we get here, but sometimes we think that the book of Revelation was given to us so that we could make really cool charts about how it's all going to go in the end. And the truth is, it wasn't. It wasn't given for that purpose. The book of Revelation was given to encourage John. He's fallen apart under the crushing weight of what is happening, not just to him, but the people he loves. He's falling apart because of his losses. And so this book is given to him first to be of encouragement. Second, it encourages us. Well, there's probably not a more controversial book 
um, in the entire Bible than the book of Revelation. And there's lots to talk about with regard to context and all of that. And uh, I could go into all that, but I'm just going to let you take care of that. And I'm going to ask you if you would take that Bible out that I asked you to get. Now, aren't you, aren't you feeling really guilty if you didn't go get it right now? You could pause and go get it right now. Um, but if you could get that Bible and or take your phone or your iPad or whatever, and you could get Revelation chapter 5 in front of you, um, I'd like to invite you to join me as I read that. So here um, from Revelation 5, uh, 1 through 4, I'd like to read this if you'd follow along and then just make a couple brief comments. Then I, and that would be John, saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writings on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll and look inside. So just real quick, the scroll that's held in the hands of uh, him who's sitting on the throne, the scroll represents the future in everything that will take place in it. The angel calls out, who's worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? There's a search that's done in heaven, all through the earth and under the earth, and no one, no one is able to open the scroll. And as soon as John hears that news, he says this, I wept and I wept because no one was found to open the scroll or look inside. So here's a question. I'll just leave it here and want you to really think about it. What did it mean for John that no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll? I mean, what did that mean for his future, for the future of the people he loved? W whatever it meant, it caused him to weep and weep and weep. Uh, my Easter. Uh, you, you remember, right? Two weeks ago, cold, gray, lots of snow, windy. Um, I get up around six uh, usually and uh, got up and took my shower and got my cup of coffee a little before seven and took it upstairs to my office. On the way up, obviously looking outside and realizing this, um, I have this really awful feeling. You know, this isn't the way Easter's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be cold. There's not supposed to be snow on the ground. There's not supposed to be no church on Easter Sunday morning. And as I'm climbing up the steps and I walk down the hall into this office, I start to feel this overwhelming, and I mean this overwhelming kind of sense of, of despair and of discouragement. By the time I uh, sit down, I can feel this, and I've felt this before. I think you've felt it before, too. It's just this overwhelming sense of sadness, and my mind starts to jump from this is what I've lost. This is what I've lost. This is what... And it's just... It's the opposite of counting your blessings. It's counting your losses. And uh, I start down this road and start feeling the loss of control of my life. I'm even starting to think, you know what? I hate my life. I hate the way that things are this way. And uh, I'm, I'm not really a crier, um, but I sat in my chair staring um, into nowhere for quite a while and just sat there and tears just started going down my face and uh, my stomach starts to hurt. I, I feel my shoulders feel heavy. It just feels like I'm just kind of like collapsing on the inside. So time out, back to the text. In our story, what I just 
read for you, um, it's really compressed time. And what I mean by that is, is uh, you and I read these stories kind of like they happen as fast as we read them. So that um, when John says, I wept and I wept because no one was found, we somehow, because we can read this so fast, we imagine, you know, uh, John cried, Boo! and then that was it. It was over. But John makes a point to say to us, I wept and I wept. To, to try to help us understand that this, this, wasn't, this wasn't a 10-minute a uh, little ordeal that he went through. This was a period of this gut-wrenching weeping, and it went on for a while. Well, I, I sat up in my bedroom for a while. I mean, what are you going to do? You're not going to go to church. Um, and I sat there thinking, kind of moving in and out of this, kind of uh, crying and, and uh, just kind of this heavy despair or whatever. And I want to share with you that by the grace of God, um, at some point, hour, two hours into this thing, um, I finally feel prompted to uh, go to this old standby. And, and you, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. I've been in, and I'm guessing you've been in this place before too, where it feels like you're in meltdown. And at uh, 62, I've been in meltdown several times over my life, and I've kind of discovered that the reality of my meltdown is, is I can't get myself out. Uh, I, I can't stop it. But I have learned that when it happens, the thing that I really want to do is I want to try to surrender my heart to this place where God often speaks and that place is in music. You know, it, it's not magic. It doesn't mean I can just kind of go um, put myself in a room and turn on the radio or my um, iPod or my phone or whatever, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm happy camp. That's not what I'm talking about. It's not magic. It doesn't work every time. But it's kind of like um, seeds in the wintertime. If you want seeds in the winter to grow, you put them in a greenhouse. You don't throw them in the snow in, the, in your backyard. You put them in a greenhouse. And so f what I've discovered over the years is, is that music is like a spiritual greenhouse for me. So often when I get really, really desperate, um, I'll go take a long ride and just listen to the radio, listen to my music on the radio, and, and just let let good um, music roll over my soul and, and ask God to just meet me in this place. When it really gets bad, you'll think, some of you will think this is funny. Um, when I'm really desperate, I listen to Handel's Messiah. There is something, I, God knows what, there is something in Handel's Messiah that oftentimes can speak deep into my heart like nothing else. So as I'm sitting there, it dawns on me, yeah, I ought to listen to some music. I ought to turn on the Messiah. So I look for my phone. I don't have it with me. I've got the Messiah on. So I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just grab my computer, turn on the computer, and and watch the Messiah on YouTube. And I put it on, and I start listening to the Messiah, and um, it just, I, I just feel awful. And then something that I, I've never, I don't ever remember doing in my, on the side, you know YouTube, right? You, 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 whatever you're looking at, you're watching right here, and then there are these suggestions on the side of music that you would watch. It's because of an algorithm. Somebody made an algorithm that, recognizes what you like and puts it there. I thank God for whoever wrote that algorithm because on that morning, on Easter morning, um, there's this song over here. I'd never seen this artist before, but the name of the song was It Is Well. You know, the old hymn? I, lo I love that hymn. And I just thought, I got to listen to that hymn. So I click on this It Is Well song by Christine Marco. 
And it's not the old hymn. Can you believe? At first it was like, what? Come on, sing the old hymn. And for some reason just sat and listened. And I'll tell you, um, I sat and listened and watched and just cried. Um, and when the seven-minute song was over, I just kind of did it again and watched again and watched again. It was so powerful. I've even asked um, Nate if he would uh, put this just little one-minute, 24-second clip in here for you so that you could watch it and um, you could just hear it for a minute. So please take a look and then I'll share with you what happened. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well. So did you hear in this song, I mean, there are a couple different lines, but so wake up my soul and trust in him. The waves and winds still know his name. Let go my soul and trust in him. The waves and winds still know his name. You know, I'm, uh, I'm responsible for pestering you as a church with this question, what's so amazing about Jesus? I'm sitting there listening to this song and wondering to myself, so what is it that's so amazing about Jesus? What is it that's so amazing about him that I need to hear today? Listening to this song over and over and over and over, and after a while, probably an hour or so, I, mean, I listen to this song. I mean, there's, not thousands, there's thousands of hits on this uh, YouTube site because I put probably 500 of them on there. But I'm listening to this song, and um, all of a sudden I remember this, this uh, sermon talk thing that I heard that uh, one of my preaching heroes, Richard Mao, did one time. And all I could remember was is it had to do with a scroll and, and someone not being able to open it and, and whatever. So I, I look it up. It wasn't that hard to find, right? It's the Revelation 5 text. And... Um, I'm reading it, right? There's a scroll. Nobody can be found to open the scroll. John starts weeping. And then you come to the next verse, verse 5. And I want to read that with you uh, today and then just invite you into something. Then verse 5 says this. After John's been weeping and weeping, then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the Lion of Judah the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. When I heard that and read that over and then read it over and read it over again, I start to realize that in days of great uncertainty, in days of loss and grief and confusion, there is a place of certainty, and it is in the future. But the, the certainty is in who's unrolling and unfolding the scroll. It's Jesus. He hasn't lost the 
privilege of planning. He hasn't lost control. His purposes haven't been sidetracked. His purposes are being worked out in the chaos of all of this. And in fact, even in the book of Revelation, the point of Jesus opening the scroll is so that John knows it's not hopeless. It's not off the rails. There is purpose in meaning and it is unfolding just as Jesus plans. So I really want to invite you this morning, would you join me and would you respond to this solid, this powerful, this unshakable truth that Jesus is able to unroll and unfold this scroll, the future, whatever that means for any of us. And would you respond like, like I sense God pressed on my heart to wake up my soul, to trust in him. Waves in wind still know his name. Not only is Jesus the one who is worthy to open the scroll, but he's the one, the whole book of Revelation is about this, who makes a way for his children as they move through the chaos of the future. You know, some, some of you are watching this and they're going, what is the big deal? Um, and others of you are going, oh yeah, I know. Um, some are having a great day today. I pray Sunday's a, a sunny, happy day. It might not be. And others of you are going, I'm feeling it big today. And I want to say to both of you, whoever or wherever you are, when you experience, not if, when you experience the loss and the heaviness and the the grief that comes with this thing, I want to encourage you. Jesus will meet you. He'll speak to your heart. And I want to encourage you with this very simple thing. He is worthy to unroll the scroll. That has been so, so encouraging to me in the last couple of weeks. And I hope it will be for you as well. Amen and amen. These last uh, two songs that we're going to um, have, I'm, I'm not sure who's singing them, but these last two songs, I want to encourage you to make them your prayer. Not just sing along or listen to them, but make the words of these songs your prayer as you respond to this good news that Jesus is worthy and is able to open the scrolls.
So I'd like to uh, make a suggestion before uh, I just give you the benediction, and that's this, that if you've experienced God meeting you in a, uh, a place of grief or a place of loss or of disappointment during this um, COVID-19 thing, could I ask you to do this this week? Would you call? Would you write? Would you email? Would you share it with someone this week? You see, what happens when we take our experiences, like I just shared with you, when we take our experiences and share it with someone else, it actually not only encourages other people that God is working and God is calling and God is encouraging during this time, but it actually opens my heart up even uh, to a greater work that God wants to do. And I'm sure that uh, the Lord God will do that for you as you share with others. I think 2 Corinthians chapter 1 um, is what I'm kind of thinking with that. And now I just want to say this is a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.